welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Avir, and we have Ron Biancini, who's the CEO and founder of the company. Uh, welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you, Rich. It's great to be here. Well, Ron, I've got your slides up here. Why don't we start with that, and uh, we'll follow it up with some uh, Q&A. Sound good? Great. That sounds great. Thank you. So um, let's go right to slide two. This gives you an agenda of what we're going to talk about. We basically have a, an update to our product, and there's really three big items we're going to talk about. The first is we have two new models, and um, as usual in tech, the big things that happen with these new models is they're bigger, faster, and cheaper. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit of the details behind that. And then what we're going to talk about after that is how we've allowed users um, kind of from customer demand to grow the cluster size beyond what we are able to do before to let us scale to bigger sizes. And then the third thing we are going to talk about um, really is the advanced analytics we provide. Um, we really let people drill down and see how our product works and what it does. And we have given people a lot more different ways of slicing and dicing the data to look at it. And uh, we have gotten some very positive feedback on that as well. So really, we'll, we're going to talk about those three things, bigger, faster, cheaper, increased scaling, and advanced analytics into what the box is actually doing for everyone. So if you go to slide three, what I really want to start out with is, is kind of a little bit of background um, just to remind everyone of where we are and how we got here. Up until this point, we've really been talking, we've really been focused more on the technology and explaining our technology and making sure that people understand the technology. At this point, we have hundreds of systems out in the field, lots of customers. And what we're finding is the customers are kind of aligning themselves into three use cases. And what I really want to do is spend more time talking about the use cases or, or where our box fits in. Those three use cases are first, um, application performance scaling. I'd say about a third of our customers are taking their data centers to performance levels that were not achievable before. Um, the second third of our customer use case is all about storage and user location independence. Basically, people are using our system to hide latency associated with remote um, data storage from where the users are. And then the third use case is to dramatically cut costs there in the data center. So if I can spend a minute as to, as to how we come up with those three use cases, um, if you remember what our product is, we don't actually sell the entire NAS um, system. What we sell is an appliance that lets you optimize your, your NAS infrastructure. And so what we've done is we've taken NAS, which is traditionally a single monolithic entity based on a single CPU with drives behind it, and we've turned it into two stages. One stage is, is a transactional stage, which deals with all of the user I.O. That's the piece that we build. We build an appliance that does that. And then behind us, um, we assume that you have the NAS filer itself, which is doing the bulk data storage or the mass storage. And the way, the way our system works is it, it tries to offload operations from the mass storage server. And very typically, we run at an offload of about 50 to 1. And actually, we have users that scale well beyond that. But in staying with the 50 to 1 example, what I mean is a cluster of our system will take 50 ops that come in from the end user. And 49 times out of those 50, we will have tiered the, the user data properly onto the faster media of storage, which are located within our cluster, and then we'll service those transactions from within the cluster. Only one out of the 50 times will we have to go get the block from the mass storage server behind us. So the way you think of this new two-stage NAS architecture is a cluster of Avir nodes sitting in front of the mass storage server, and the sole purpose of our nodes is to offload the mass storage server, and you can think about that offload as roughly the 50 to 1 range. And so if you think about that 50 to 1 offload, now you should be very, should be very easy to see how we service these three use cases. In the first use case, performance, whatever transaction rate, whatever bandwidth, whatever throughput you get from your storage infrastructure now 
as you put an AVIA cluster in front of it, you can scale that to 40, 50, 60 times the performance and then effortlessly scale your I.O. Um, to beyond what you were able to get prior. So that's really our performance use case. And again, like I said, about a third of our customers in there. The, the third one, this location independence, imagine wherever your users are, at that location you put in a VR cluster, and now that Avir cluster is servicing 49 of the 50 operations per second or uh, operations. Only once does it have to go across the LAN to wherever the remote location is where your storage is. Well, it turns out if, you, if the users only see that WAN latency one out of 50 times, it, only, it, it almost becomes irrelevant. They really see 49 times local, high-speed, solid-state latency and only one times the WAN link. And really what we see is people are now putting their data storage just anywhere around the globe and they're getting what appears like local storage performance even though the data is actually stored somewhere else. And that really makes up the second third of our customer installations. And then third one is just cost savings. If, if you generate a workload X and you put a cluster of our nodes right next to that workload, what comes out of the back of ours is 1 50th of that. If you're only sending 1 50th of the load into your filer or your mass storage server, all of a sudden what you could do is you can replace all the fiber channel drives that are there with high density SATA drives and you'll, your users will still see the same performance level but your SATA drives only have to deliver 1 50th of the performance of the fiber channel. So in this third use case, we have our customers just taking racks and racks and racks of fiber channel drives and replacing them with a, a few U worth of SATA drives, getting the same capacity, but doing it at much lower cost, much lower real estate, much lower power and cooling. And that really represents the third use case. So kind of with that as background, let's look at what we've done um, in this product update. So if we look now at slide four, you'll see we've, re we've actually released four new um, appliances. The first is our 3000 series. This is the series that the, the media is really based on um, SAS spindles. So first we have the FXT 3200 and the FXT 3500. And th these products compare with the product we're currently shipping, which is the 2550. The 2550 has 3.6 terabytes of SAS but with these two products, you see we raised that up to 4.8 terabytes of SAS in the 3200 and 9 terabytes of SAS in the 3500. So it's, it's really in, in the entry level 3200 now, it's 33% more RAM, 33% more disk, and we're keeping the price the same. So bigger, faster, um, same price. And the 2550 will actually live on, and we're going to reduce the price on that. So our very entry-level box will have a lower entry point into the, um, into the market. All right, so that's the 3000 series. That's the SaaS-based media. Um, if you now go to slide five, you see our 4000 series, and this is our solid-state-based media. And the big news here in the 4000 is that um, our prior SSD system, the 2750, was based on SLC flash. What we've done now in the 4000 series is we've moved to eMLC, and we're actually moving from the Intel X25e part, which is the SLC in the 2750, we're moving to the Intel 710 series, both in the 4200 and the 4500. And actually, because we're changing from SLC to eMLC, you see a much bigger, much more dramatic increase in capacity. We're basically um, going from three to six times the capacity that we have in the 2750. Our old 2750 was a half a terabyte of SLC capacity. The 4200 is 1.6 terabytes, and the 4500 is three terabytes of SSD. And so the, the net result is three to six times the capacity, but we're also at... Um, 275% cheaper price per gig when we do that. So the price per gigabyte of, of solid state is coming down at the same time. And really that's a function of the move from SLC to EMLC. 
All right, so, so that really covers really the first third of what I, what I wanted to talk about, which is our new FXT models, um, bigger, faster, cheaper. Now, if you go to slide six, this really talks about our cluster size. You know, one of the things that's very, very important in our architecture is that as you add nodes in the cluster, the nodes find themselves. They actually use uh, the IEEE Bonjour protocol to find themselves. They determine how much media is in each of the other nodes in the cluster, and then they globally share that media. So as you add nodes in the cluster, the capacity available to your users grows linearly. But also what that means is the performance that the, that the user sees grows linearly as well. And in the, in the, up until this product release, we supported up to 25 nodes in the cluster, but we've really been driven by our customers to make it grow beyond that. So starting with this release, we'll now support up to 50 nodes in the cluster. And if you look at what that does to the total capacity, that brings you up to 7 terabytes of RAM, 450 terabytes of SAS, or 150 terabytes of solid state that can be globally shared in the cluster and available to all the users and the applications using the data center. So I think it's the combination of each node is getting bigger and faster, and now we've, we've doubled the previous max cluster size to just completely let you scale the capacity three, four, five times of where you could have gone before, um, all to a single application, a single performance level. All right, so that's really the first two-thirds of what we wanted to talk about. The last third, if you move on to slide seven, is really our advanced analytics. analytics. So, the important thing to note, the, remember um, early on, I talked about this 50 to 1 offload. The fact that 49 times out of 50, I was able to do service the transactions within my cluster, only one out of 50 did I have to go outside of the cluster and go to the mass storage server. The, the underlying technology that makes that possible is our tiered file system. Basically, the user is doing read and write and metadata requests into a, a file system, and we actually have blocks of that file system at any given time can live in multiple of the different media types. And the, the, the underlying technology that makes this possible is our TFS, or tiered file system. So for us to make TFS work efficiently, for every single block in the system, I maintain metadata on how that block is being used. And that metadata include things like what frequency is it accessed? Is it typically read or is it typically written? And um, has it been randomly accessed within a large file? Or is it a small file that's randomly accessed? Or is it a large file and it's sequentially accessed? All of that information within the metadata about that block is what enables me to pick the right media type for that block. Well, in the 1.0 release, we thought that metadata was very important to us, but not very important to anyone else. Um, and so we, we kind of kept most of it inside to ourselves. What we learned from our customers is that there really are two different constituencies here. There's the IT staff that is running the data center, and then there are users that are putting applications against the data center. And, and typically, they don't actually know all the time what the other person is doing. So although the user has some idea of the type of workload and the type of use case that they're running against the data center, IT typically doesn't see that. And so what we learned is this information we keep that, keeps, that makes TFS work so efficiently turns out to be very, very useful for the IT people that are running the data center so they can see how the data center is being used. They can learn what users are using what um, part of the data. Um, and then use that information to help manage the applications, to help manage um, um, the data center and the users. So what we've done with every dot release since 1.0 is provided more and more visibility into our metadata, into how the, the, the information is being used. And I think with this, with this latest product update, we've really set a new standard of, of the visibility into the different views and the different ways and to look at some of these metrics. There are literally a thousand or more metrics within our system um, that, the, that the user can look at. 
And I think, you know, up until now, we were very good at doing cluster-wide metrics. We now let you drill down and to, um, and to view things um, based on lots of different subsets of that. So if you look at this chart on slide seven, um, basically you have the ability, you notice across the top, there's the, the, the dashboard, the general purpose dashboard, what we do, and then there's various setting pages you can go to. But you can go to the analytics tab. Within the analytics tab, you can select certain graphing options. And you can even create graphs that you particularly like to view and then save those and call those back at later times. And then within those graphing options, you can choose a view. You can choose one of these um, different parameters that you want to look at, and then you can take subsets of that. So you might, here we're looking at CPU utilization, and then you can choose to do that cluster-wide. You could choose to do that per node or just the IP. What coming in from one particular IP, what's that doing to CPU utilization? Or what is one particular client doing? So we now give you much, much greater granularity into, into how all these different um, types of data affect the CPU utilization. And then the last thing we did on the very bottom of this slide is we allow you to very generally pick time frames that you can look at that. So, you know, a thousand different metrics or way to view the, view the data, um, lots of different ways of taking subsets of that. So you can analyze one particular user or one particular node from another, and then very, very flexible on time scale. And I think the thing I really like the most about our analytics view is it's all very straightforward. It's, it's point and click and grab and, and stretch. And so you have these very flexible ways of, of looking at the data. So again, on, on slide seven, we did this CPU utilization cluster-wide. And if you now go to slide eight, what we've done is we've now looked at um, NFS ops um, on a client network, but looking across only one of the servers. So looking at a particular IP address and then looking at what the operation rate is across that one. This just shows by node, um, by create rate within that, um, within that one node. So I think seven did a good job of showing you, showing you broader cluster-wide. Eight did a good job of showing you um, how we drill down. And then if you now go to slide nine, one of the other things that we added in all this is instead of just keeping a very narrow range of time where all these stats are available, we let you go back and look at historical stats you can go back in time and you can pull up any time period and see how the system performed. And then what we allow you to do is we allow you to do these side-by-side -side views. So on slide nine, we show you two time periods, but the same variable. Here it's um, NFS v3 ops, and we then allow you to pick up, you know, two, three, four, up to eight time periods, and you can compare how the system was running across those periods. And in, in, in this example, you see that in the later time period, there were a lot more lookup um, calls. And then, of course, the, the, the IT people can go in and try to figure out what changed in the application um, to cause that to happen. So really, in the, in the edit graph button, if you look in the top right, you can pick these different views, pick these different time frames. You can even annotate them so you can explain to someone why you created these views. And then you can store these, create them, and pull them up at any time to see how things have changed. And then um, slide 10 is just another example of that. This, is, this is, is slightly different in that it's the same time period across two different metrics. So here on the top of the slide, we show FXT throughput. And on the bottom of the slide, we show ops per second. So now you can see how the throughput and the ops play off against each other over the same time period. But again, I think on slide nine, I showed looking at a particular set of, of metrics, how they compare over different time intervals, this shows same time interval, how these metrics compete and compare with each other. All right, now if you look at slide 11, slide 11 is probably, um, I think, the most advanced thing we've done in this release. It's the one where we clearly get, have gotten the most positive feedback on. When you have a very large system like this, there's a lot of ops coming in over time. It's very hard to visualize how your system is performing. There are lots of different variables you need to see. What's the latency, the typical latency? 
what is the average latency, how, what's the, the, the range of that latency, and how it varies over time. And so what we've done here is we've came up with this um, heat map type of charts, which lets you actually look at three variables at once, an x-axis, a y-axis, and then an intensity or a heat map, which gives you the, the, the third variable. And so if you look at these two graphs, what we do on the top is we show latency per op over time on the, so the y-axis is latency, the x-axis is time, and then the intensity at any one of those coordinates is how many operations we've seen at that time during that, with that latency. And so if you look at this top chart, what you notice is in the second half of this time period, actually things got faster. You saw more and more operations at the lower latency period. So the user sees that things are, the, the IT person sees that things are speeding up. So I think this heat map is a very nice, easy way to look at complex, you know, three variable um, analysis. Now, on the bottom half of this, this um, chart, we did a very similar um, uh, three variable um, heat map which shows your read operations and the size of those read operations over time. And what you can see in this, in this chart is the overwhelming number of read operations are in the 32K block range, but there's also um, another component of about 10K block size where the read is pretty intense as well. And otherwise, there's a pretty even distribution um, across the board. And so this just gives you another, this just gives the IT person another way to visualize um, how his cluster's working and exactly what the cluster's doing. And I, I would say we've probably gotten the most positive feedback on these heat maps or these histograms, um, which allow you to look at multiple variables, lots of complexity all at once, but gives a nice, very clean interface to do it. Um, so with that, if we go to slide 12, I think this just kind of brings to summary the three things we talked about. So the first is our new models. And as you would expect in tech, we've, we've gotten increase in performance and capacity, 33% RAM and SAS for our disk-based system, 33% RAM and 3 to 5X for our SSD-based system. And the big driver there, of course, is moving from SLC to EMLC. Um, and then, of course, with this move to EMLC, we see just a very large reduction in almost one-third um, price per gig for the um, SSD-based system. And then we talked about our ability to increase the cluster size. So we doubled the cluster size from 25 nodes to 50 nodes, which effectively allows us to support larger and larger data centers across a single cluster. And then the third one, which clearly is the one we've been getting the most accolades about from our install base, is just these advanced analytics. So for the first time, you know, I think we've, we're clearly setting the bar here in allowing the IT administrator to look inside and actually understand in a very detailed way what his data center is doing and how it's supporting all the applications that run on it. Um, so Rich, I think that really summarized where we were, um, what, what we're announcing with this release. Um, is there any questions or any other discussion you'd like to have? Well, sure, sure, Ron. I'm, I'm curious about you know the analytics. Let's start there, the most recent thing. What do they do with this information? It looks like you're giving them a lot of insight into what's going on. What do they do with that once they know that? Do, do they tweak the ratios in, in the tiered file system? or What would a use case look like? That's great. So I think some of the, some of the, the, the intent here is for them to understand um, how they could be tweaking the caching layer. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples that they could do there. The first is, um, one of the parameters that we allow users to set is our write-back delay. The write-back delay tells you how out of date you'll allow us to keep the mass server, so how much write caching we'll do before we'll force to write back. And so what, you'll, what, what the user will be able to see is um, if the latency of the writes start to increase at the same time that we're writing back to the mass, that tells the user that we've just hit his write-back delay. And now he has to choose. He either has to improve the bandwidth from us to the math server, or um, he has to be able to extend that write-back delay out um, to, let us to, to let us to cache the writes longer before we're forced to write them back. So some of what um, he learns is 
is there a parameter or two that he wants to change to increase the performance? The other thing that he could see, if he no notices that the cash is starting to thrash, that maybe we're not operating at a 50 to one offload anymore, maybe we're down at 20 to one, or more 25 to one, that means it's time for another node because he needs more capacity in the caching layer, whether it's read or write, to be able to store more of the data. So, so some of what he learns um, lets him play with the parameters in the caching layer or in the mass storage layer to, to further optimize those. But I'd say probably more often than not, what we see people using this information for is how to help, um, how to help tweak the applications themselves. And, and I'll give you a really good, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you two examples. The first is we had a really simple one. The, the user put all these analytics in place and he noticed that the hottest file in the system, he sorted ops per second according to file, and he noticed the hottest file in the system, I honestly don't remember the name of the user, so I'll make up the name. It was something like johnsmith.config. Well, it turns out that John Smith, when he wrote his code, he was supposed to read this config file once at the beginning of the program and then run this inner loop a million times. Turned out he was opening the config file every time he started the inner loop, and that was a bug. And the, the, the crazy thing about that bug was the program worked correctly, but it was just using a ton more data center resources than it should have been, so much so that this file popped up to the hot file list. As soon as the IT person pointed this out to the user, he said that should never be the case. They found this bug, they moved the config file read outside the inner loop, and all of a sudden they got like 5% more cycles back in the data center that they didn't have before. Um, the other thing that people use it for is um, sometimes it's, you can use it when, to identify the difference between an I.O. limitation and a CPU limitation. So for example, if you have Oracle running on a, um, a, a server and that's pointed to the database that's on our storage, but the users notice that Oracle performance is off from what it should be, it's very easy to pop open this graph sort it by the Oracle server to look at its I.O. rate, and if the latencies to that server are low, that points to a CPU bottleneck. It's time to upgrade the Oracle server. If the latencies to the Oracle server are high, that means the, uh, the, um, the cache isn't large enough. It's not actually sending enough transactions back to the Oracle server. It's time for another node in the cache. So I think those are, those are so there's two examples of how the user can use this information to, to change what's going on in the, in the data center, and it gives you two examples on how the user can use this to help optimize his application. That, that's helpful. Thanks, Ron. So I'm curious, you know, you're out there talking to a lot of customers, I imagine, right? So has, has yeah. the conversation about SSDs, has it changed over the past year or so? Is it... Are you, do you find yourself selling the idea of SSD anymore, or is it a different conversation? Great question. So um, it's clearly changed, and um, it's changed from um, selling SSD to, to selling the architecture on the quickest way to get SSD into the system. And um, honestly, I think one of the things I'm the proudest of in our solution is I think we've got one of the least impactful ways of inserting SSD into an environment. So maybe two, three years ago, the discussion was, here's the performance benefit of SSD, here's why you need SSD in your application. Today, if the user says, I know I need SSD, I don't want to re-architect my system, please show me how I can get SSD in here as easy as possible without having to change what I do. Because, for example, if if the user's consider, considering a server-side um, flash card, they're changing their application. They have to completely reconfigure the app or the server so it knows to use the local card and when to use the local card as opposed to using the, the storage. With our system, you know, we, we change NAS from this one-stage entity to this two-stage entity. We just use NFS when we talk to the NAS server, and we use NFS or SIFS when we talk to the user. And so because we dynamically re-tier from the SATA on the MAS to the SSD in our box, the user makes no changes. He takes his application as is. Instead of pointing them at the old MAS, he points it at us, 
and then without any config changes, without having to, to do any, to crack open the server and plug in one of these cards, without any complication, he gets the benefits of SSD without the complexity of reconfiguring. So I, yes, your an the short answer is yes. It went from having to teach people the benefits of SSD to instead showing them how our solution provides a very easy um, path to getting SSD into the data path. So kind of a, a wrap-up question here, Ron. You know, uh, everything I'm reading these days is all about the explosion of unstructured data and uh, how this is just going to continue to grow exponentially. Are, are you bullish on the market where you guys are playing? I mean, is the sky the limit here? Absolutely. Um, well, let me give you one very particular example. Um, VMware. Um, VMware when people um, architect a VMware solution, they have a choice. They can run it on blocks or they can run it on files. And typically, if you look for best practices, um, people will tell you if you want something that's easy to manage, um, easy to configure, easy to do snapshots and backups, do it on NAS, um, right? Do it unstructured. If you, if, but if that NAS filer is your performance limit and you need um, a VM implementation that gives you very high performance, you have to do it on structured, you have to do it on SAN, you have to do it on block. And um, what we're finding with our solution is I can offer, because of the tiered file system, I can offer people that they can keep all the ease of use of NAS, of files, yet get or even exceed the performance of doing this on a block-based infrastructure. And so I think probably the biggest take up we've had in the past couple of quarters has been with VMware users who are trying to stay unstructured as long as possible, yet we can show them that the sky's the limit on performance, and so there's really no need to get off of that. So they can have all of the ease of management and all the ease of configuration of a NAS implementation. So I think that's just one really good example with a very large um, customer base of people that we can show them the sky's the limit on performance, yet they can stay with NAS. So I, I'm very bullish on the, on, on the unstructured um, data and where it's taken us. Well, that's terrific. Sounds like you don't have to give them a trade-off. They can just, uh, you know, turn up the performance and uh, get where they want to go. So terrific. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Ron Biancini, CEO of Veer Systems, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show today. Great. Thank you, Rich. It was a pleasure. All right. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Uh, stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.